to Dr. Matt Springer with the University of Kentucky on Snake ID. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, yeah, so we, we um, often have a Snake ID segment from, from the woods uh, today, for, uh, which is run through our Department of Forestry Extension team. Uh, at University of Kentucky, and you can Google that, and it'll pop up, and uh, that's weekly at Wednesday at uh, 11 o'clock, uh, and it runs for about usually around a half an hour, and it has a various topics, usually seasonally based and appropriate timed, um, so I really encourage you to go check that out. There's uh, various um, topics ranging from white oak genetic works and, and and how do we farm trees to all the way to what I do with snake ID and food plots and, and interesting topics on wildlife, how to make red, uh, red bud jam, uh, and so on. So I do strongly encourage you to go check that out, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to talk about snakes, uh, something that um, always gets a reaction to folk, from folks. Uh, usually it's either very positive or very negative. Um, and the biggest thing and most important thing I want uh, to get across to you today uh, is really how to, to identify ones that you need to be more cautious about, you know, so our, our venomous species uh, versus those that, um, you know, are non-venomous and really play an important role in our ecosystems in Kentucky, whether that be in the woods, um, the fields, or potentially in your garden. So I'm going to pull up my screen here. Um, and I need somebody to let me know that it's working, if you could. Um, so. It's working. See. All right. So you guys have, uh, basically, what I'm going to highlight here is I'm going to go through a lot of information relative to how to identify a snake here, probably in the next 30 or 40 minutes or so. But more importantly, well, I want to draw attention to this resource that we have through our department at UK, and at UK called the Kentucky Snake Identification Page. And it's basically your, your end-all be-all for snake information for all of our Kentucky species. Um, and it has various uh, tools in it, including an ID your snake function so that you can uh, put in the characteristics I'm going to teach you about today. If you have seen a snake in your backyard and you want to know what it is and you can catch glimpses of the characteristics and by your location, there's a tool in there that'll help narrow down uh, the options that exist uh, for IDing that snake and hopefully um, be able to get it down to one or two species to, to allow you to, to most likely have a sense of calm because we have way more non-venomous species than we have venomous species in Kentucky. Uh, and honestly, we have four venomous species in Kentucky, 32 total species, and really, we have three venomous species because the one uh, species of rattlesnake is only found in land between the lakes out in Western Kentucky. It's, um, we may have single digit numbers of those individuals in our state and that's how few we have. But we do have uh, the timber rattlesnake, the cotton, uh, copperhead, and the cottonmouth or water moccasin, uh, which is not found east of basically the Green River, but it is quite prevalent uh, in Western Kentucky. So this website can be found at kysnakes.uky.edu. You can also Google Kentucky Snake Identification and it will pop up as one of the first resources. That and the uh, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife resource. So this um, effort was actually mostly done by Dr. Steve Price, our herpetologist within the department. Andrea Dreyer, who's um, a basically a, a tech aide uh, who does wonderful research with, with herps. Uh, and Renee Williams, who is a um, communication specialist within the department and I came in on the back end and, and helped add a few hints and topics that I thought may be improved uh, but for the most part those guys did all the hard labor on this. So let's start with how do you identify a snake and we're going to go through several characteristics as it relates to looking at a snake in the field okay. The first one that we want to start off with is the actual body shape of a snake. And sometimes you get a full glimpse of the snake. Sometimes you catch a piece of the snake as it goes by and slithers under the grass or cover or wood, pile, rocks. But generally, you can get a good enough grasp on certain characteristics, even with a quick glimpse. So the first one is the body shape. And it ranges really from a slender body, which is going to be long and very skinny, as you can see here with the green snake a moderate sized body, which is more going to be like a grat snake, garter snake, where you have 
um, some some heft to it, but it's not what you would call chunky. Okay, it's um, you know usually proportionate within the, the length of the snake, uh, where you know a two foot snake might be nickel to quarter size around. Where you get into a four or five foot snake, you're talking you know maybe half dollar size around. Where you know things change drastically when you get to the stocky body shape. And why this is important because you know your venomous species that we have in Kentucky, those pit vipers, really fall into this stocky body shape. Okay, and these are going to be you know when they're small um, and juvenile size snakes, it's not as prevalent. So they may be a foot long and they don't look as chunky, um, but they'll still have a slightly larger body relative to their size than say a moderate snake. But when you get into those adult snakes that are three, four, five foot long, you know, it's not uncommon. I hear people say, I saw a five foot rattlesnake, man, it was as big as a softball around. That is possible, especially if you go further south and you get into the diamondback rattlesnakes, those things get huge. However, we don't have those, but our timber rattlesnakes who are very close relatives will have that very large body size to them. The next thing that um, we would, you know, usually tell people to pay attention to because the, with us only having pit vipers as venomous species, this holds very true, is the head shape is a very good indicator for venomous versus non-venomous in Kentucky, okay? If it does not have a triangle shaped head, if it has that round head, as you see in the picture with the mud snake there, that black and red snake, a round head, it is a non-venomous species in our state, okay? Now, we do have species that have more triangular shaped heads, okay? Several of our water snake species, especially in Western Kentucky, will have very broad heads that they can flatten out when they uh, get defensive that look more triangular shaped. So, if it's a rounded head snake, it's definitely non-venomous. Triangular head, we have some species, probably four or five, that are non-venomous, but all of our venomous species have that triangle head. And to be honest, the triangle head is very distinct in the venomous species because that's where, uh, you know, the pit vipers, they have a the huge head, they have their venom sacs in there, they have their nostrils and everything else that's going on that makes them a pit viper. So they have a very large head um, relative uh, to, say, the rounded head. Okay. Other things that are easy to use to identify um, venomous versus non-venomous in Kentucky are pupil shape. Okay. And most people will say, I will never get close enough to see a snake to I use its pupil to identify whether it's venomous or non-venomous. And, you know, a lot of times you are right. You can see a snake from afar and you will never be able to get close enough to that. There are times where you get surprised by a snake and it is two or three feet away from you because it was hoping you were just gonna walk by it and you can see that pupil, okay? If it is a round pupil, you are good. All of our non-venomous species have round, round pupils. Our venomous species um, will have a slit, a vertical slit like a cat, okay? So a vertical pupil. So if you see a snake that has a cat-like eye, that is definitely a venomous species in Kentucky. Even, so if you see a snake that has a triangular head, but a round pupil, that is a non-venomous species. So this is a better indicator than the head shape if you're close enough, okay? So eye shape is very important. Then something that gets even harder to see, but because all of our venomous species in Kentucky are pit vipers, they need to have a pit present in order to be that namesake, right? None of our non venomous species have it. But a pit is basically um, located, it's a, an, an organ located right in the front of the, the nostril that allows them to detect the presence of their prey through um, various sensing, you know. So if it is, um, because our venomous species are in the present, they use that organ to have a rat go by. They'll, they'll sense the rat going by using that organ. So if you see a slit, as you can see right there, just in front of the eyes, on the nose, and it's a little gap opening, almost like another nostril, that is a pit, okay? Only our venomous species have that, and that is another indicator. But once again, if you can see the pit, you can definitely see the eye because uh, it is so closely located. So um, generally, you know, 
it's one of those that, yes, they definitely have it, but it's probably not the best thing to look for if you're worried about if it is this venomous or non-venomous. Finally, um, one that um, is only handy if you are looking at a dead snake uh, for um, the public's sake. Uh, it's sometimes handy for us when we're doing uh, identification of snakes um, or when we capture snakes is if you look at the underside of a tail uh, for the snakes and it has a single row of scales behind the vent. So the vent is where, you know, they're going to poop out of where they also have their young if, um, if they're a female or lay eggs depending on the species. So if you have a single row of scales from um, the vent back minus the, if you look um, at the first scale, set of scales right behind the vent is a, is a double, no matter what. If it continues as a double, okay, that is a non-venomous species. So from that anal plane vent on back, a double is a non-venomous. If it is a double, one single double, and then singles the rest of the way, that is a venomous species. Now this can actually come in handy if you get a shed skin. So if you find a shed and, and the end of that tail is still intact, you can actually tell if it was a venomous species or a non-venomous species by using this characteristic, okay? It has to be a very, um, you know, a pretty pristine shed skin in order to see that, but this does come in handy. So multiple um, double row from the anal vent back is a non-venomous, single is a venomous species. Uh, other things that aren't necessarily, um, that even hold true for all species uh, or even within the species itself, but is based on age. Uh, so you can look at the tail, okay? And the, obviously rattlesnakes have a very unique tail that has a um, evolved function that the, the basically they're, um, and when they shed, they add a layer of rattle-like um, or a layer of, of scales that are allow them to make a noise that sounds like a rattle, thus their namesake. And as those snakes age, that rattle will actually get longer because with each shed, it kind of increases in size. The other thing that um, sometimes comes in handy and is especially true with small copperheads is that they, if you find a small snake with a pattern, it has a green tail that is a juvenile copperhead. They use that tail to bait um, their prey. They kind of wave it and use it as like a fishing mechanism. Um, but all you know, one-year-old copperheads and, and younger will have that green-esque uh, tail on them. So if you see a snake that's dark in pattern and all of a sudden that tail, the last two, three, four inches is a, a very you know, different color than the rest of that snake and it appears olive-ish to bright green, yellow, that is a copperhead. Okay, so those are that's a good indicator for a juvenile that doesn't necessarily have that big stocky body yet that the rest of the of um, the species does when it, it gets larger. Um, and Shad will tell you that he, you know, there, and there are many people that will say um, anecdotally that they if they smell cucumbers, they they believe that is associated with with uh, copperheads. Um, and Shad, I did a little more digging into the subject since we had this talk uh, at, at the, the webinar. Um, there, and you know, we just talk about science. There's no scientific evidence to show that their fecal matter is, smells like cucumbers. However, what is believed is that it's the individual, um, that individual person's way of interpreting the smell of that musk of the snake when they emit it uh, for danger that they think that, you know, genetically it may smell like cucumbers to an individual. So that's where, where that is. So, um, I have not, when I've encountered, it doesn't smell like cucumbers to me, Matt, but when, yes, sir. When we smelled it, it was when it was agitated. It had to be really agitated. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder, and they, prior to that, and they, they put off some, a lot of snakes will put off a, um, basically they'll, they'll poop on themselves. And it's a musk is what we use scientific terms of musk. And they think that there's people genetically kind of like the asparagus issue 
with urine. They think that it may be um, actually associated with how that individual smells that musk. It comes into them as a cucumber. That's the, the, how they interpret that smell. So to me, it doesn't smell like that. So I'm like, eh. Um, but it, that's what the uh, scientific consensus is on it. So to some, it may smell like cucumbers. To Shad, it does. So to me, it doesn't. So that's one thing I learned thanks to a very good question from Shad. All right, so I just walked you through several characteristics of snakes that we use on the fly and how we identify them. That's not, you know, it, the, the way I kind of approach this and how to ID snakes, the, the best I, I thing I can do, I think, is to give you pictures of snakes that I receive and try to walk you through how I identify them. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do kind of step by step for a couple of these. Now, if you watch the From the Woods today, the first two are gonna look very familiar. But after that, there are a bunch of pictures that I get, um, especially every starting about every April, May, I will average about six to seven pictures of snakes a day that I identify for our county extension agents in the public. So I get a lot of them. So I threw a few in here. Um, just so you can kind of get a sense of how difficult this is sometimes, but also how quickly you can really learn to identify between venomous and non-venomous. And I think that's the most important thing that if I can get you to do anything today is to be able to do that. So we're going to start off with this picture right here. Um, and I don't know if, uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you're trusting enough to, to turn off the, the mutes of folks. If they want to talk about whether or not they vote it's venomous, non-venomous, we can do that through chat. Um, it's kind of up to you. They should be able to unmute if they'd like. So if, if folks, you want to, to go ahead and, and uh, tell me your thoughts as we come to these pictures, um, I would, I, I'd much rather have this as an interaction rather than me just talking to you as these pictures come up. So. Non-venomous. Non-venomous. Non okay. <laughs> tell me why. Round well, up. Round eye, that's a great characteristic, right? This is a great picture of that. What else, you got the head shape, really good view of the head. Okay. And then uh, patterning wise, this is kind of a, a very odd and, in, and, and um, not really a banded pattern. And you notice I didn't really talk about patterns when, when I went through this, but it's kind of a, a characteristic we use. Um, so we've got banded uh, solid colors, checkering belly. But most of the time, they can. There's a lot of variation between individuals, so we don't really talk about banding too much, because um, usually, if I say a banded snake, everyone says copperhead, and we're going to get to that here in not too long about what you can actually use in the banding to to help you. So, so yeah. So this is a non-venomous species. That rounded eye and the head shape really stand out. Real quick, you know, this snake is not going to cannot harm you, uh, outside of maybe leaving some some tooth marks if it bites you. We use that patterning and we can actually plug the colors, the eye shape and the body. You know, this would be a moderate size body uh, into our, our snake ID site and you'd actually come up with a common garter snake, uh, which is correct. And you can see there's a lot of variation. Just that, that snake that's pictured here on the, on the uh, web page is actually more of a yellowish green rather than this very um, more Christmas tree kind of color green in my mind. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a, a, a actual color of green, but that to me, that's what stands out. Uh, it's a, it's much more blue green than uh, yellow green, uh, at least to me. So this is one um, that was actually submitted from the Daniel Boone at Red River Gorge. And it, I would say is a pretty common way we end up seeing snakes, right? Sitting there curled up under a rock or right, you know, under a log or some way that I was hoping it was, you were going to walk by. So venomous or non-venomous, what, what do people think? Venomous. Venomous. Why? Pit, you straight eye. That. Yep. The triangle head. Mm -hmm. Yep, very good. So you nailed all those characteristics. There's the pit, okay, the, the pupil. And um, this is the banding pattern here is what I want to bring up. And uh, you were here last, around last week, I kind of mentioned that I'm from Pennsylvania. And the one feature I like to use being that I'm from Pennsylvania and, and what I like to relate this to is on, and this is a copperhead. Um, 
you know, and this, this individual definitely has the, the color of the head meets the namesake. Um, but the banding pattern here, the dark bands on copper heads, we have several species that, of snake in Kentucky that have bands, but the dark bands on copper heads are wider at the base of the belly and narrow to the top of the, of the body. So as they approach the spine, they narrow and they give the appearance of a Hershey kiss. Yeah. And this is basically true for every copperhead that you'll see. The pattern will hold, will basically hold true to that. Okay, All right. So that's one that I think people can probably remember. If they see a banding pattern, they see that. The other banded snakes, like um, our water snakes, will either be almost um, straight lined up where they won't really decrease in size or increase in size as they, they change or they'll be inverted where they'll be um, broader at the top of the back and get narrower at the belly. So that Hershey kiss is a, is a really good feature. So there's our um, website for it. And you can see that's a, a different copperhead. Uh, and you can you know clearly see those dark patterns broad at the bottom, narrow at the top, kind of Hershey kiss looking. So here's another one that we have, okay. So venomous or non-venomous? Non-venomous. Non okay. Same two people, huh? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the feature you used? Round eyes. Uh, yeah, this, this is a really handy feature when you have a great picture like this that you can see the eye. Um, this is actually one of the species that has a relatively large head that can be triangular shaped. Um, it's our, what's one of our water snake species. Now it is also banded, okay? But as you can see, uh, the banding actually um, is large at the top and narrows towards the belly. So it is inverted, okay? So this is the northern or common water snake. And I do not recommend, even if you know they're non-venomous, I do not recommend picking up a water snake. They are the meanest things I've ever met, bar none. And um, most herp herptologists do not like picking up water snakes because they will bite and bite and bite and they will leave a nasty little mark on your arm or hand because um, they eat a lot of fish and amphibians and they have some relatively large teeth that are hooked to hold on to them um, so it's not a very comfortable experience all right so here's a um, picture that was submitted and if you want to have a snake identified that you find that may be dead this is a great way of taking pictures of it okay because what I can see is I can see the belly, I can see the banding pattern very clearly, and I have a picture of the head. A close-up of the eye would be awesome, but this gives me everything I need to know. Um, so venomous or non-venomous? Non-venomous. Ma'am, how did which feature did you use this time? The underside, the belly. What what about the belly tells you it's non-venomous? Well, it's checkered, and so it's a corn snake. Ah, mm, close. No, no. Snake. It's a non-poisonous coral snake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where's my buzzer? Do I have a buzzer? Eh, no. Eh. Um, so it's a relative of the corn snake. It's not actually a corn snake. Milk. It's very similar in color. I'm sorry, what was that? Milk snake. Yes, sir. This is the Eastern milk snake. Milk snake. Okay. Yep. Um, now these guys um, were, you will find them throughout the state of Kentucky. Uh, a lot of times they'll be in barns or in rock piles near barns and they are, um, they do a lot of rodent consuming for you. Um, uh, they actually get their name because dairy farmers would see them, would run into them uh, generally in the stable with the cows. And they thought they were actually hooking onto the others and, and taking milk from them. Uh, in reality, what they were doing is they were catching the mice that were getting into the feed for the cows. So that's the, the story that I have uh, found for their name. Um, whether or not that's true, I don't know, but that's what I've traced it back to. Um, but so a better feature for this guy, uh, not necessarily the belly, is to actually look at that head shape and the top and the body shape. This is a moderate size body. It's uh, generally proportionate the entire way. It's not what we call hyper thin, and it's definitely not chunky, bulky um, size for, a venom, for a, our venomous species. And if you had a close up of the pupils, it, they would be rounded as well. 
Um, and these guys are, are quite pretty in many ways and their colors, they can be a very brilliant red uh, contrasted with that black. So uh, they're good ones to have around if you can bear them. Uh, if you're, even if you're not a snake fan, these are good ones to have around for rodent control. Red on black, venom black. So uh, that one you have to be a little care. So red to black, you're all right, Jack is another way of putting it. And that actually holds true for king snakes and coral snakes is what that saying is actually meant for. Um, because in other countries, red to black actually does not necessarily mean you're okay. So um, if you're in areas like Florida, Georgia, Alabama that actually have both coral snakes and king snakes, scarlet king snakes, it's red to black, you're all right, Jack, or red to black, venom lack. Red to yellow, you're a dead fellow, um, is generally a saying. So um, it, it holds true, but we don't have that to worry about in Kentucky. Uh, we do have the scarlet king snakes in some areas, uh, and they will have that red to black appearance um, as well. So, but you don't have to worry about uh, coral snakes uh, in, in our, snake, our state. So here's a very common, very tiny snake that we'll run into a lot uh, on roads or in gardens. Gardens. Is it venomous, non venomous? Non venomous. Okay. These that's very true. That that head shape is very small and narrow. And if you look, it's it the pupil looks like a um rounded uh eye. Um if you have to zoom into this one. Um but this is actually the decays brown snake. It's probably one of the most common snakes I get pictures of uh behind gray rat snakes. And these guys are invertebrate eaters, slug eaters, uh, and sometimes small amphibian eaters as, long, as well as uh, worms. Uh, so if you have some pretty loose soil uh, around, they'll be somewhat close. Uh, you'll find them under rocks. And uh, if you have metal laying around, these guys are often found under there. Um, they're they're um, a relatively dull colored snake, um, but um, usually pretty passive. Uh, don't get too irritated. Uh, so, but fairly common. All right, what's this one? Wow. And all its, all its uh, hiding glory. Is, is that a... It's a copperhead. Is it? Looks so, like why do you think it's copperhead? The pattern looks like a Hershey kiss to me. Yes, sir. You got it right. So that um, pattern holds true and nailed it. The head is a little bit hard to tell because it's kind of got it positioned weird, but it looks pretty big. Um, definitely can't see the eyes. Aren't going to be able to see the pit. Uh, but this is using that pattern there that you can see. This is a copperhead. So it's one of our venomous species. Well, doing pretty good. All right, what's this one? This is getting a little harder. Hogno snake. Oh, good guess. Good guess. It is not a hogno snake, but that is a very good guess. So venomous or non-venomous? Let's start there. That's the most important thing, right? Looks like it's got round eyes. It does, yep. It, it does have round eyes, so that's the key. Um, the folks that sent this picture in were 100% sure it was a copperhead because of the head shape. And it definitely has that head flattened out to give a triangle look and to look as mean as possible. Um, but this was actually in Franklin County uh, along the Elkhorn. And it is a very, very large and very angry uh, northern water snake who's getting ready to shed. So he's very dulled out. Um, but he definitely flattened himself out to make him seem as mean as possible. So if we look at the contrast, though, you can kind of see a banding pattern. Uh, if you zoom into the picture, it'd be no a little bit more noticeable. But the uh, water snake actually is broad at the top and slight slightly narrows at the bottom. Copperhead, once again, as was pointed out, has that Hershey Kiss look. So I'm glad you guys picked up on that so quick. Okay, here's a fun one. <laughs> So you got a tail, you got a head. That's none. 
non venomous. There we go. Very good. So it's a solid black snake with a very white head under our neck, I should say. But you know it's non venomous. You can get a really good look at that head shape and that pupil. So that's a good start. Um, so anybody actually know this species? It, that, that white throat kind of gives it away pretty well. Is it a racer? It is, yeah. Very it's good. It's a black racer. Racer. Yep, and these guys um, are, are fairly common, especially forest and ag fields uh, where they meet, uh, or grasslands. Um, so along, you know, any kind of hay fields. And uh, these guys are, their eyes are relatively large to their body size and their body, their head, head size. Uh, they're a more visual predator. Uh, so they'll go around and they do, they have this behavior called uh, periscoping, uh, which is uh, what it sounds like where they'll actually pick their head and, and part of their body about, you know, a third of their body off the ground and start looking around trying to see what's going on. So you may be walking in the field and all of a sudden see the snake rise up out of the grass and looking at you, which can be quite alarming. Um, but that's a very distinct behavioral feature for this racer species, for racers in general. So if you see that, yes, you may, may jump, but you can immediately be calmed, I guess, and, and, and soothed in the fact knowing that it's a racer and, and therefore a non-venomous species. Hey, Matt, yeah. I got a funny story for you on this one. Let's hear it. When I was growing up, I actually lived in a place called Viper. Kid you not. It's in Perry County. Okay. And I had one of these up in the woods above me that came in my general direction very quickly. Oh, and these guys are fast. I, I fell backwards down the hill trying to get away from this snake in a place called Viper. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they do not, um, they're very deserving of their name racer. They're um, a relatively slender snake, more slender than um, your rat snakes, and quite quick. I mean, they can move uh, very fast. So, uh, and sometimes they, because they just respond to visual, they will sometimes go the wrong direction and come at you, even though they're trying to get away from you. Um, so I'm sure you're not the only person to roll down a hill. All right, um, so here's a, 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 a pretty colorful um, specimen. It's obviously banded, okay? We've got a full-on picture. Now this thing, I'm gonna give you some, some reference here. It's only about 10 inches long, okay? So is it venomous or non-venomous? Looks like a round eye. Yep, very good. So we use that feature. We know now it's, you know, if you wanted to, you could pick it up if you wanted to. Um, now these guys is a, they're a common sight um, here in about a month. End of the summer, early fall, you'll see um, these guys will start appearing. And that's because this is actually how that black racer, their babies, when they hatch from the eggs, this is how they look. They're not a solid body. They have a banding to help um, them hide. And this banding will actually fade into that solid black over the next year or so, year and a half. Um, and they're, these guys are pretty hard to tell the difference between them and Eastern milk snake uh, juveniles at the same size. They have a very similar banding pattern. Uh, so it's, um, if you see a snake like this, the round eye is the best feature you can use. You can look at the tail, it doesn't have the greenish tail, but it does have a strong banding pattern. Uh, and this is either a black racer, ju juvenile black racer, or a juvenile eastern milk snake. Um, and they get much, color-wise, this is a pretty dull one. They are, they can be quite um, uh, stunning uh, as juveniles here in terms of color. All right, so here's one that is um, pretty interesting and sometimes alarming if you walk outside and look on the side of your house and, and this guy's creeping along to your patio. That's All right. Nose. Yeah, there we go. You nailed it. Nose. This is the hog, our eastern hognose snake, and uh, a quite colorful one. Uh, these guys range in, in uh, color from yellowish black, as this one is, to almost entirely black or dark. Uh, they're um, toad specialists. They actually have a um, specialized fang in the back of their mouth that they use 
for popping the belly of toads when they puff up. So toads will puff up when they're, they're caught uh, and they do that so that the snakes cannot actually fit them down their mouth. Well, these guys have developed that fang to pop that belly so they can swallow them. Um, they're also what we would call the drama queens of the snake world. Oh, yeah. Um, it, yeah, if you've ever seen how these guys react, if they they feel scared, they, they start off doing the normal um, defensive postures. Uh, all, by the way, all snakes rattle as their defense. So rattlesnakes have that specialized feature that makes it sound bigger and badder. But all snakes will rattle their tail and vibrate their tail, uh, which if they're in a pile of leaves may actually sound like a rattlesnake. So that is a common behavior to scare uh, predators away. These guys will start doing that, they puff up, and then um, if they still feel threatened um, to the point where they know they can't get away, what they'll do is they'll actually play dead in a very disgusting way. They will throw, open their mouth, throw their head back, start squirming their body over itself, while pooping on themselves and rubbing it all over them, all over their body as they go. And eventually will finish by not moving anymore with their head arched up the back and, and then, you know, acting, playing dead like a possum. <laughs> so it is a drama queen. It is a drama queen and a half. And, um, you know, they I also kind of spit and hiss a little bit. They, oh, they make lots of noise. Yep. Lots of spitting and hissing. Yes, they are, they are full on vocal, uh, visual, and, um, you know, the smell is not something you want to be around either. It's, you, I, I wish it would smell like cucumbers. Uh, with <laughs> so, um, overall, though, they can be quite pretty, and um, you generally, outside of the drama, uh, are relatively uh, unlikely to bite you uh, over and over again. Um, like a, a water snake will. So um, not too common. Uh, however, these guys are often victims uh, of the fact that their banding pattern is very strong and they have a very big head in order to eat those toads and a pretty thick body. So they fall victim to being confused with copperheads quite a bit uh, and probably are the um, most easily confused with a copperhead uh, based on their banding pattern and also a rattlesnake uh, as well, um, given um, the dark uh, banding um, and larger body size relative uh, to its head. And they end up like this. Oh, um, so this is actually the most common way I get pictures um, from folks. And, um, you know, unfortunately, 99.9% .9 of them are actually non-venomous species. Uh, so you guys take a look. You can, you can kind of see, is this a uh, venomous species or non-venomous species? I don't know if you, it's a, yeah, if you look closely at the pupil, it's actually a round pupil. Um, and uh, there's the rest of it. It had actually just done this person a favor and ate a mouse. Uh -huh. uh, in the garage. So that's what that big chunk is right there. Um, and this is uh, our most common species of snake in Kentucky especially around houses, uh, it's the gray rat snake. Now these guys can, yeah, it's the gray rat snake or sometimes people call them the black rat snake. Uh, that's up for debate among herpetologists on the proper name for these guys. Um, however, um, either way, it's, you know, they're rel very common and um, will um, <laughs> often be seen doing things like climbing up a porch trying to get to the dove nest on your porch that is, or robin nests in your bush in the front yard. Um, they're, they will raid nests and eat eggs. They'll get in your chicken coop sometimes unfortunately um, and they can get what quite large. Uh, there are reports of upwards of seven eight feet long. Um, generally they won't be a super fat snake when they're that long. They'll, they'll maybe baseball size that's the biggest after they've eaten. Um, however, a four to five, six foot rat snake is definitely more common. Um, these guys are relatively mild tempered uh, and will just try to get away from you. Uh, they spend a lot of time climbing. They're very good climbers. 
um, because of their they wanting to you know get to nests and and birds to to consume them as their prey items. Um, so sometimes you may you know be walking in the woods and unfortunately have a snake sitting above you in a tree limb. Um, not his fault, not your fault. Uh, just happened to be where they were. So here's one uh, picture I get a lot from boaters um, in the summer. And um, you know, you're, you're going along or folks that are out fishing, swimming in the stream and the snake comes buzzing by them, snap a picture and you get a good look. Um, usually they're you know, either underwater or on top of water, um, but this is a pretty clear picture of this guy. Um, so, Venomous, you know, knowing that both venomous and non-venomous species in Kentucky will swim, is this a venomous species or a non-venomous species? Non-venomous. Do you say venomous? Non-venomous. Non-venomous. Why do you say that? Slender body and small head. All right. That's a good, good uh, features to use for that. Um, also, we look at the banding pattern. The color is right for a copperhead. However, dark bands, thick on top, narrow on the side of the body. So it is a uh, northern water snake or a common water snake, uh, depending on which uh, nomenclature you want to use. Uh, same thing. So there's that, you know, that banding pattern as a comparison to that. And it's just the opposite. Um, so real quick and easy, you know, right off the bat, it's not one to worry about. How about this guy? This is from Dale Hollow Lake. Copperhead. Yep. And this is Ooh. in the middle of the lake. Yeah. He was trying to get from one side to the other. Right in the water. So one of the, the behaviors I want to point out that's true about 99% of the time is that venomous species, when they're actually swimming, they don't swim a lot. But when they are swimming, they'll tend to stay on top of the water. Whereas your non-venomous species of water snake, because of, the, of how they go after prey and, and their, their hunting, will actually spend, they can be like this, but a lot of times they'll also dive completely underwater and try to swim away that way. Your venomous species are very unlikely to do that. They'll try to stay on, on top of the water. And this guy is, you know, he's doing the periscope thing where he's trying to figure out what's going on with the guy that's pulling up in the boat. Uh, this is a really big snake too. Uh, he's a chunker uh, for sure. Here's a very alarming way to run into a snake. Uh, if you look, that is actually the uh, snake is coming out of the top of um, the car hood uh, from inside the car. So it's coming down by the rear view mirror, just popping his head out. So did venomous or non venomous? Did the person survive this? <laughs> Luckily, it was the correct person to see this. They didn't have a um, horrible fear, but I can see some people never getting into a car again. Non-venomous. Yep, non-venomous. The pupil is a pretty good giveaway. The head shape. Um, this guy is a, a really colorful version of our gray rat snake. So he got himself in there. I don't even know how, but he did. It's a it's a smaller one too, so they can they can fit into places that you never imagine. No, I do not have a picture of one popping out of a toilet bowl in this. <laughs> so here's here's a tough one. This, like is, a this is from Muhlenberg County. Huh. So Western Kentucky. Mocha this is going across from an ag field to a uh, flooded um, woods. Water moccasin. Anybody else have a guess? Looks like a black snake to me, but. Got a pretty stocky body. It, it's got a chunker. It's it's a definitely a hefty snake. It's a pretty long snake and a large snake for sure. Um, however, this picture's in here because I can't identify everything. So this is one of those where you don't have a really great view of the pattern, the color, any of the body shape features. Uh, unfortunately, this is one that, you know, I could tell you it could be this, you know, it could be a water moccasin, cottonmouth. It's, you know, in the right county, they have them. Uh, it's going from one habitat to another that they couldn't be found in. It looks like it could be a rat snake. 
um, of some speed. You know, it, it could be the biggest racer, black racer we've ever seen. Um, so it's just tough and we just don't know. So I, my point for this one is sometimes we can't do any better than, hey, it was a snake and it was big and it was dark. And yeah, it could have been a venomous snake. Um, it's not a copperhead. That I know. That's one I do know. And it's not a rattlesnake. So outside of that, I can't really help you. Um, but I just wanted to throw it in there to give you the heads up on it. It's not always possible. So here's a uh, interesting one. Um, so we have a relatively uncommon species, unless you do a lot of rock flipping. Um, this guy is found um, almost entirely uh, a little underground. It's one that spirit spends most of its life. Um, and it's a smooth earth snake. Uh, it's a, a very weird shape. They're small. Um, the worm snake is a similar species that looks a little bit lighter in color, um, more worm colored, um, pinkish. Uh, so very similar size and um, just one that I wanted to throw in front of you. Uh, head shape pretty much tells you that it's a non-venomous. Um, these guys are, are really meant to be underground most of their life and they're shaped that way uh, to do so. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there and with the, this was submitted and you can see the, the size reference they gave this was the can of chew. Uh, so these guys are not very big snakes. And this is a full grown adult. So wrapping it up, it seems like you guys caught on pretty quick, which makes me happy. Um, but in general, when you guys, when you encounter snakes, you want to make sure you're identifying what snake you're dealing with right off the bat. Know whether it's venomous or non-venomous. That's the most important thing. Gives you that, you know, gives you the peace of mind. If you can do that, that you know in Kentucky, if I see that snake and I get a good look at it, uh, the eye, the head, I know if that's venomous or non-venomous. Do I need to give it a good distance to go around it? or is it not as much of a worry, um, is really important. If you don't want them around your house as much, your garden, you want to reduce shrubby areas, get rid of rock piles, wood piles, put them as far away as possible, uh, because anything that's going to attract their food source of rodents um, or is a heat source to, to keep them warm and, and when it's, um, you know, temperature is not as, as hot, they're looking for that heat so metal, a pile of metal is going to attract snakes, eh, no doubt about it. A wood pile is going to attract snakes. So if you eliminate those areas, those items around uh, the places you don't want to run into snakes, that'll help. Keep your grass mode short. If you have a, a landscaping, you want to keep it to a minimum because that provides cover for things like chipmunks and mice, and it will attract them. So make it so that there's no cover and there's no food there, and they'll be less likely to come to it. They're, keep in mind, they're always, um, you know, these guys play a very important role in our ecosystems. They, uh, there's, there's research out there that has shown that, you know, species of like rattlesnakes actually reduce tick loads and lower the risk of Lyme disease if they have a strong population in the area. And that's because they're controlling the rodent population, which is a big part of that tick life cycle. So having snakes in the area that help control rodents actually has cascading benefits for our health on top of helping to eliminate rodents that are potentially causing problems in your garden or chewing in your house and so on and so forth. We have a great resource with the UK snake website at ky.snakes.uky.edu. Has all the species of snake up and some information about them, lots of pictures, lots of images, has that ID your snake tool. Um, so if you have any questions uh, or you run across a snake and you don't know what it is, try that tool out. If you can't figure it out, please uh, go ahead and contact me. Um, here's my uh, contact info. And the best thing you can do is, is email me a picture of the snake if you have one, uh, or a really good description focusing on some of those body parts, um, you know, those, those body uh, characteristics. I was talking about color, shape, head size, those kind of things, and location. Because um, sometimes it, there's snakes in the western part of the state that are way different than snakes in the eastern part um, and even though they have very similar appearances. So knowing where you are is, is important. But outside of that, I, I mean, that's all I have here for Snake ID. Um, a lot of it is just practice. It's what we do with our students when we're teaching them how to identify snakes. Here are the characteristics. Let's go look at some snakes. So I took a similar approach, and I hope it was useful. But um, 
with that, I will take any questions. And I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see your faces again. All right. Matt, great information there. Thanks so much. Very good. No problem. Any questions for Matt? Are, Matt, I have a question. Are, <clears throat> excuse me, are venomous snakes characterized or viewed as being more aggressive than non-venomous snakes for the most part? Yeah, so that's that's definitely something that we hear talk about or certain species. Um, a lot of times uh, folks will say cotton mouse will chase you. They're so aggressive, they'll chase you. Um, you know, it's, it's one um, where I think a lot of those um, come from interactions with snakes where they may have been, you know, just trying to get away and they picked a direction and just picked the wrong direction and came at what they were trying to get away from, uh, which is usually you walking through the woods somewhere. Um, they're, you know, the thought that venomous snakes are mean is one that definitely is, is something I've heard in every state that I've lived in. Um, and, and I would say this uh, is true with all wildlife species is that every individual has its own personality. And that's more of a problem than anything else is you never know what you're going to encounter when you come up on an animal and what its personality is. Unless it's a water snake, they're mean as it can be, no matter what. Every water snake. Never want to touch them. One was in my dog's kennel this spring, and the dog was scared to death of it. And when I got the hoe to move it out, it was just repeatedly striking. So, yeah. Um, I mean, it's it. So we were doing um, a hunter recruitment event down at Robinson Forest. We had a we had a UK um, learn to hunt program with Fish and Wildlife, and we were getting ready. We were doing the last sight in. We were up on the WMA that's right next to Robinson Forest there. And we were doing our, our, our getting ready to shoot the guns and make sure the kids are still comfortable. And um, Becky Wallen, who's the R3 coordinator, got out of the truck and was standing there for five minutes in her Crocs. And for five minutes, she was standing on a, a two and a half foot long copperhead <laughs> mid body. And the thing never bit her. Just was like, I'm good. I'm good. And she picked up her foot and it just went off. <laughs> so. You know, everything you could think of, it, it all depends on how those animals react to the stimulus and its individual personality. And, um, you know, we can have come across copperheads down in, in, um, in Robinson that are striking at you before you even get close to them. And a lot of that has to do with how threatened they feel. And generally, the smaller the snake, the more of a defensive reaction on the aggressive side you're going to get because they know they're small. So sometimes it's, it's more of a, I'm, I'm a very tiny thing and I'm going to put on a show to try to get that, uh, that threat away from me. I'm going to try to scare it away. So she got very lucky and, you know, she was sweating it for, I, I'm surprised. I was actually surprised she didn't walk away and get sick because she was, whew, I wouldn't want to do that. Not in Crocs. That's why I don't step out <laughs> without my snake boots on. Hey Matt, you've got a question here about do mothballs work to keep snakes away or marigold, marigold clouds. Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we always talk about giving scientific backed um, facts, and there is nothing out there on um, mothballs or marigolds uh, actually working. However, there's nothing out there saying they don't work. Um, there is some evidence that things like the snake away powder pellets that they have in the store that they sell, I would tell most folks there that it's probably not worth the, the money to buy them. Um, uh, they snakes do use uh, their sense of smell quite a bit. However, uh, it's a mothball or a lot of mothballs in the environment aren't necessarily going to keep them away. And to be honest, the, what we know about mothballs now in the environment and or in our house, it's probably not a good idea to put them out there. Um, for for the sake of you know yourself or the animals that are outside, the ones that you even want around. Do they get more aggressive when they're shedding? Uh, that, that's been so, a yeah. constant thought. Um, so there's there potential there's definitely potential there because when they're shedding, their eyes actually their vision clouds up as that second skin, so they are not able to see as well as they would be if they were not shedding. So how they interpret that lack of vision, um, 
I, I would say it's probably uh, true that they may be more aggressive. Um, probably they feel a little more vulnerable. Uh, however, it's, my, it's more anecdotal probably than anything else. Are they real heat sensitive? Can they detect the uh, The pit vipers are for sure. That's how they, they're detecting. They're using heat. Um, more, the other snakes that are not pit vipers are, are not using heat at all. They're, they're using their, you know, they're using that tongue, that tongue's going out and that's, that's sensing for smell and chemicals that, that they are for sure more sensitive, but the pit vipers are, that pit is detecting heat source. So the, the, the tongue is what they use to smell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So when that tongue comes out, they're, they're tasting in their environment to, to see what's going on. Are the babies more poisonous than the adults? So, um, there's a lot that goes into, you know, so a lot like, so we get the question of which, which species is more venomous than the other species. And, um, you know, in Kentucky, I would say all of our species are about the same in terms of their potency, but really what really goes into what, um, you know, in terms of, of potency and, and a snake bite, um, Bigger snakes obviously have more venom available to them, okay? Because they have more stored, they're larger, you know, their, their glands are, are ready to go and they're bigger and they can produce more. Um, so they also are very much controlling how much, when they bite, they control how much venom they inject. Um, and what I would guess uh, happens when the, with the younger snakes, is they're going to bite and eject, inject as much venom as possible so that they survive, where a lot of times the older snakes, um, it, there's a statistic that's out there about 50% of bites in defense are actually what they're called dry bites and they inject no venom whatsoever. They're relying on that bite to actually be the thing that scares you away because it's really energetically costly to make that venom. So if they're, if they're going to constantly be threatening and, and, you know, if they feel like I can, by bluffing and biting you without the venom, I'm still going to survive. They're going to hold it back. Um, so there's also the, the fact that where you get bit plays a big role. So if you get bit on your hand, it's a lot different than say get bit, bit on your face uh, and how that venom gets distributed and how quickly it gets distributed. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into it. Um, now, if you go down south in the diamondback rattlesnakes, uh, they're, they are a little bit more potent and usually a lot larger. So you get a little both. Um, so it, it all depends. Um, but I would say the, the juvenile snakes are probably more likely to use that venom in bites than the adults. Yeah, another question here about, uh, is the dog days of summer truly a molting season for snakes? So um, molting or shedding is something that snakes will do um, usually a couple times a year. Um, so when they go into hibernation uh, and, and their hibernaculums, um, in you know October ish, when they emerge, they usually have a shed within about a month after they emerge in April, depending on temperature. And that shed actually, um, usually that's associated with mating season for a lot of the species. And that shed actually kicks off that um, reproductive cycle. And then they will shed depending on um, their health and their growth rate. So if they had a good year and, and ate a lot and grew a lot, they will shed. Um, more frequently than uh, say if it was a drought year and they haven't eaten a lot and they're physically stressed just because they're not growing as much. Uh, a lot of our species grow pretty quick, especially your water snake species. They grow real, really fast uh, and will shed a lot more, um, especially as juveniles than say adults where they're not growing as quickly anymore because they're already a large animal. Um, so you will come across sheds in the dog days of summer for sure. Um, that's because uh, it's hot enough. Those animals, if they get a meal, are able to digest it. They're cold-blooded, so they need that heat to, to keep their metabolism up. So they're able to digest that meal quicker, so um, they can grow more in the dog days of summer, for sure, which would then potentially lead to more malt, uh, shedding or malting, in this case, as, as you guys use it. Does that answer your question? I hope. Good. So, oh, okay, there's a good question. What local species give live birth as opposed to eggs? 
Um, so yeah, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of our rat snake species all are egg layers. Um, so our, our gray rat, our milk snake, uh, the racers, um, mm -hmm. our, there's, oh, let's see, what else, which other ones? Um, king snakes, whereas uh, both our copperhead and our rattlesnake are, are those that give live birth, which actually, um, they really have a soft egg inside them that they actually hatch from the egg inside the body. So it's not truly a live birth in that sense. Um, so they're pretty unique. Um, garter snakes uh, are ones that give live birth as well. Um, and a lot of our water snakes will give live birth because of the fluctuations. If they have laid eggs on the, on the shore, they, there's a high potential of a flooding event, which would then cause them. So they'll, they'll tend to give live birth. Uh, so queen snakes, um, your water, your northern water snake, common water snake uh, will, will give live birth as well. Um, it's pretty, I've had, when I was growing up, my first encounter with that was I caught a garter snake, brought it home. Uh, I convinced my mom I was going to hold it for a couple of days in the, in the tank I had downstairs in the basement. And we went down the next morning and all of a sudden there's 23 snakes in the tank. And she was very, very uh, upset with me of all the snakes I brought back that she didn't know about. Um, uh, so, but she quickly caught on when all of them were about like five, six inches long, uh, except for, for one. So. You um, remind her that you're making a living at this now? Oh, she's fine. I, I won't tell you how many snakes I had. My, I learned my genetics through snake breeding. That was the thing my dad and I did together. So I'm, I'm one that loves snakes uh, for the most part. I never had any venomous snakes. They wouldn't get me in there, but I, I really enjoyed having uh, rat snakes of various species. So. Have any of you here been to a place on High Knob called um, um, the Towers? I know what you're talking about. I've not been to it. I went to the towers last year and I was told by now when we get there, just behave yourself and it will, it'll be okay. But there are hundreds of rattlesnakes and there were. And you, in order to see the towers, which you're looking down on three big um, standing, individual standing hills that look like towers, there were huge, big old rattlesnakes all along the edge of that ridge and they were all coiled up resting but beside of them were all these baby piles of baby snakes and we were and, and there was a good distance in between these if they were all around the ridge and we were told you can go ahead and walk out there because they're docile if you don't if you don't bother them and uh, or not well I did because everybody else did I guess I was the last one um, and down and under that ridge of rock, there were huge, huge snakes on a shelf down and under. I don't think I have ever seen that many snakes in one place. And the baby snakes, I guess, were fascinating because they were so close to probably their mamas or whatever, but they just were just there, quelling around each other and letting us walk by. It was fascinating. And I'm, I'm probably exaggerating, but to me, it looked like hundreds of snakes, but um, it was quite a few and some very, very big ones. Very, uh, and it was common knowledge that they're there. A lot of folks go there. And, and so kind of a unique thing. Well, I may have to make yeah. that. You, do, you should, you really should. Yeah, that, that, I mean, I just kind of want to see it. And there's, there are places. Um, that are near hibernaculums where the snakes will come out in the spring, like April, May, and you'll come out and there may be hundreds of snakes in that hibernaculum. And they all come back and forth every year to, to winter together. And they'll come out and they'll just hang out there and you'll, you'll come across them. Uh, I knew of one in Pennsylvania that I would not step outside the truck where I was working because uh, there's easily 30 or 40 rattlesnakes on one giant rock every, you know, for, for two, three weeks. So, <laughs> Very good. Any other questions? Looks like we've gone over just a little bit. Matt, you did a great job. Very, very, good. Good. very, yeah. very good. Proud to be it. here. So. Really appreciate it. And uh, Chris is uh, saying that you did a, a very nice presentation and thanking you for it. So, um, no problem. I enjoyed it. Great. Thank you for your information.
Shad, you want to cover real quick what's what's taking back place on Thursday? Yes, yeah, so Thursday we've got the uh, Woodcraft Safety, which um, there's been a little confusion with some of our folks that thought we were talking about woodworking. And uh, this is like backcountry uh, nature craft, I guess we should call it. But uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk about problem plants, uh, what to do about uh, snakes uh, as far as protective uh, gear, uh, bear issues and how to keep safe in bear country. And I think uh, Phil's even going to cover something maybe about water safety. So how to purify your water, that kind of thing. And um, I, I think we're tag teaming that one, aren't we, Jeremy? I think so. I think all three of us have a little bit of a role in that. All right. So all right. that's this week. Sounds good. Well, we'll see everybody uh, 6 o'clock Thursday. Matt, thank you again. We appreciate you coming. Glad to be yeah. here. Everybody have a great evening. Bye-bye. Take it easy.